so uh, today what i will be doing is i will be talking about uh, the recent changes or just a few months couple of months back there has been a new addition in the neonatal resuscitation uh, uh, guidelines that uh, we follow uh, this usually comes in from the american heart association and it is translocates into the pas nals and all the uh, als and uh, bls modules so uh, i will be uh, talking through the initial steps and the uh, uh, basis and the uh, relevant changes from the previous edition to this edition uh, very briefly so this is uh, how uh, the placental circulation is while the fetus is in, still in utero the baby's sorry the baby gets blood inside the right atrium from where it goes into the right ventricle then instead of going into the main pulmonary artery because the lungs are filled with fluid and there is very high resistance it can't enter there there is no uh, breathing happening while the kid is still in utero there is a duct ductus arteriosus which connects this main pulmonary artery to the descending aorta and very little blood comes back from the pulmonary veins and enters into the left atrium going into the left ventricle which goes to the lvot the aorta and joins the ductal flow and then subsequently goes down to the rest of the body so uh, as we are all aware while the kid is still in utero the alveoli the lungs are filled with fluids and as soon as the baby comes out and takes its first breath the first few breaths basically what they do is they try to clear out the fluid that is inside the lungs trying to decrease the resistance so that the air can go in the circulation can begin the duct can close there can be increased flow around these alveoli and oxygenation can happen now what we want to do this is a normal natural physiological process what we want to do what our aim is during this as soon as the baby is born and we we are trying to ensure that the baby stays safe our aim is to just assist the baby with this physiological process we don't want to do anything uh, dramatic any heroic process just help the baby to clear these fluids and continue with the normal oxygenation and breathing pattern to to establish the neonatal circulation from the fetal circulation so this is just how we can see how the vessels are constricted vessels around the fluid filled alveoli wherein as soon as the baby starts breathing and the alveoli is open up the fluid is absorbed the vessels also dilate and start doing the gas exchange and as we can see the duct which was wide open uh, here where the my, where my mouse is is now closing constricted the the pda closes therein increasing the supply to the lungs and which comes back to the left atrium left ventricle and then the oxygenated blood goes to the body uh now during resuscitation if at all uh, i don't know uh, how many are actively still involved in resuscitating newborns or attending sections attending deliveries and uh, seeing the babies as soon as they are born so if at all uh, some of you are still doing that what is why why is this fetal circulation relevant fetal circulation is relevant because all the recommendations that are there in terms of using the oxygen using supplemental oxygen is based on your saturations of the preductal arm that is your right hand because that is the arm which gets the blood supply before the duct before the pda goes out so what we are interested in is in this preductal saturation so that is why whenever attending deliveries or going to attend uh, calls for cesarean sections we should ensure that uh, if, as soon as the baby is born, born it's a non vigorous baby put a saturation probe on the right hand that is on the non vigorous uh, preductal uh, hand just a little bit of drawing but we already discussed this uh, now before we uh, go ahead i'll just uh, want to emphasize that before birth the alveoli in the fetal lungs are filled 
completely filled with fluid before birth oxygen is supplied to the fetus not by the fetal lungs but by the placenta the mother's oxygenated blood goes in and acts as the supply of oxygen to the baby and fetal lungs are filled with fluids they are not working they are not breathing they are not doing any gas exchange now before birth most fetal blood enters the fetal lungs wrong so before birth most of the fetal blood bypasses the fetal lungs and how does it do that with the ductus arteriosus the pda helps it to bypass the fetal lungs because of the high pressures as it is it filled with fluid after birth air in the alveoli causes vessels in the baby's lungs to relax dilate thus helping with gas exchange when resuscitating newborns chest compressions and medications are rarely needed it is very natural very physiological for all the babies to start doing that hardly 1 to 2% of the babies need chest compressions and medications less than 1% members of an effective resuscitation team should work independently no they should share information so if two people are attending resuscitation and they both keep doing their independent things doesn't help the baby it is always a team work team effort for the newborn resuscitation now anticipation is the most important step in a new neonatal resuscitation so we the mother has been carrying this baby for last 9 months there have been some tears some ultrasounds a lot of things that have already been there so there's a lot of information which we can understand which we can read which we can discuss with the parents which we can discuss with the family and make a plan of what are we expecting are we expecting some complicated baby are we expecting a normal baby are we expecting a lot of uh, a pale baby requiring blood transfusion are we expecting a baby with a difficult airway so all these things are already a lot of things are already there so we we need to be well prepared for the delivery and make sure that we go through the notes we speak to the family we look at the ultrasound scans we look at the antenatal work up investigations before we go for the delivery so what are the common risk factors so a baby is called term when it completes 37 completed weeks of gestation so any baby born before 37 weeks is a preterm baby a baby who is born after 41 completed weeks of gestation is also at risk because there are chances of meconium meconium aspiration a post dated post term baby is also or uh, higher incidences of uh, asphyxia or baby is requiring resuscitation maternal complications like hypertension or preeclampsia multiple gestations twins triplets or fetal anemia these are some of the common uh, risk factors that we see in antenatally again uh, intrapartum if you see that there's a fetal drops fetal bradycardia fetal distress is there sudden so there's a change in the heart rate pattern of the uh, fetus call for an emergency cesarean section they are all uh, subtle signs that tell us that this baby may need help this baby may need resuscitation so we need to be prepared so there are some four pre birth questions that we need to ask the obstetrician so what are these questions what is the expected gestational age is the amniotic fluid clear if they have done pv what did they find are there any additional risk factors and what is our umbilical cord management there's a lot of uh, uh, literature coming up in terms of the umbilical cord management and we will discuss this exactly why is it relevant and why is it so important to know and make an umbilical cord management plan before the baby is born so these are the questions you ask the obstetrician before the baby is born uh, who should attend delivery at least one person qualified who knows who is trained in nrp who knows how to resuscitate baby should be there apart from the nursing and the other assist staff uh pre resuscitation uh, team briefing that is what we have discussed that we should know the risk factors we should know the complications we should identify the team who are going who will be doing these things and delegate task if there are three people attending the delivery we should know we should tell the nurse nurse you are looking after the saturation probe uh, the other junior doctor maybe you you can look after the airway uh, the third person can look after the uh, cardiac massage ch chest compression if needed so all these things if already predefined will lead to less complications less confusion during the process of resuscitation 
we should identify and make sure that all the equipments that we need are there. Equipment check should be done before the delivery. So, and there should be one person identified as a team leader so that uh, people do not keep looking around for everyone. This team leader should ensure that he or she has good communication skills. Can uh, it, it can be the same person who is looking after the airway? Should know how to effectively use all the resources and should be looking at the bigger picture. Sometimes when you are resuscitating, resuscitating someone, you are you have that adrenaline rush. You may not know what all has already gone in or what all needs to be done. So the team leader is someone who who, who is having the bigger picture, who is looking at everything in in whole in the whole uh, scenario is under control with the team leader if at all the team leader has to move there should be a clear message to the whole team that uh, there is a change in uh, the team leader closed loop communications is an integral part of any uh, uh, research station team and it is very relevant very important for people to have closed loop communications in such scenarios emergency uh, settings because otherwise it's very easy to make mistakes to make medication errors to give double uh, the amount of uh, uh, drugs that we intend to. So if at all you want uh, to give instruct instructions to someone, you should be very clear uh, with the name that A, give this medication this much MG to this baby right now. There should be a response that yes, I am preparing it or yes, I have given the medication this much MG to the baby now. So very clear closed loop communication is very important in all research settings. There should be an accurate uh, documentation. Uh, we are used to having different time uh, references. We should either stick to the clock in the operation theater or the delivery room, or we should stick to the uh, time of uh, age of the baby in terms of the time of uh, birth. So we can say at two minutes, Edri was given. At three minutes, chest completion started. But we cannot uh, use different uh, time references in a single research station. That is, at one minute, adrenaline was given. At four o'clock, chest completion started. So it should be a uniform single time reference and using the same clock. Uh, again, post uh, research station team briefing is something that uh, we don't do often. Should be done. It should be done in a constructive way. And that is the only thing that will help us improve and do better in the next subsequent resuscitations. So I will skip the questions since we are, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, equipment checklist, as I said, we should have basic equipment that is a warmer to receive the baby, warm linens, temperature uh, regulated, uh, uh, it, uh, the warmer should have a temperature sensor. Uh, if we're uh, expecting to receive an extreme preterm baby, we should have a plastic wrap to avoid the heat losses. Uh, we should have things to take care of the airway in terms of a uh, suction machine or a bulb suction if that is not available. Uh, uh, airways, the uh, appropriate size endotracheal tube, suction catheters, stethoscope, oxygen supply. If possible, we should be equipped with a, a CPAP machine. If not, then it will be intubation and if needed, and then a uh, safe transfer to a, uh, a tertiary hospital. We should also be uh, looking at uh, being uh, accessible to the drugs that we, mean, we, we may need in terms of adrenaline, normal and boluses in case the baby needs a fluid bolus. The baby can also, uh, baby can also, uh, uh, may need uh, blood products. So we should be ready to uh, do those things. We should have some uh, backup in terms of a blood bank if it is not a big setup so we should at least identify in case we need bloods where and whom to approach so now coming to the core uh, topic that initial steps how do we uh, start resuscitation so i'll just uh, make everyone see this slide because this is the most recent uh, resuscitation guidelines which has recently come up and if you can see the red box, this is what we will be talking about. These are the initial steps. And these, if we know properly, we, we can easily save 99% of the newborn babies. We don't need to go through the advanced steps. We don't need to go through the whole lot. Even if we can do this, we can safely uh, save 99% of the babies. 
So uh, just going through this algorithm, how to perform a rapid evaluation. This is what we will be doing, the initial steps of newborn care. Uh, how to decide if this baby needs additional steps or not and what to do in case the baby has persistent sinuses or labored breathing, how to use a pulse oximeter, where to apply it, how to give oxygen, and when to consider using continuous positive airway pressure, that is CPAP, and when what to do when meconium stain amniotic fluid is present. So, first and foremost step is again the antenatal counseling, introducing ourselves to the family, understanding what is the expected uh, delivery, what is the expected fetus, if, is are there any antenatally expected complications. Uh, if there are more than two people attending the delivery, we should do a team briefing. We should allocate roles to each one of them. Even if it, if you have been working together for months and years, it is still important to make sure that you have that one or two short sentences that, okay, I'll be looking after the airway. I'll be tubing, intubating if needed. You look after the circulation. If Even if that much is done, we, we, we can do better than what we did before. It just helps in ensuring our roles and doing things in a very organized manner. Equipment check goes without saying. You should ensure you have batteries in the laryngoscope. You have appropriately sized tubes. If you have a 28-weeker or a 30-weeker, 34-weeker being born and you have a size 4 endotracheal tube, it's useless. You can't tube the baby. Um, once the baby is born, now, those were the four pre-birth questions we asked the obstetrician. Now, these are the questions you use to do a rapid evaluation of the baby. Is the baby term? Yes or no? And what is a term baby? Any baby born after 37 completed weeks of gestation is a term baby. Does the baby have a good tone? Yes or no? Is the baby breathing or crying? Yes or no? If the answer to all these three are yes, all three, then the baby can stay with mother for the initial steps and routine care for ongoing evaluation. If the answer to any one of them is no, even if the baby has good tone and breathing, but the baby is not term, even if the baby is term and breathing, but does not have good tone. So even if the answer to any one of them is no, we go ahead to the next box. That is the initial steps doing warm making the baby, make sure the baby's youth are make ensuring a warm baby, drying the baby, stimulating the baby, positioning the airway and suctioning if needed. We do not do routine suctioning to all newborns. We only do suction to babies who actually need it. If you can see obvious copious secretions in the airway and you can see that the baby is choking, baby can't breathe well, baby can't uh, manage its own secretion, that is when you would go ahead and do suctioning. So after providing these initial steps, you reassess. Just a second. Okay. Sorry. So after you are done with the initial steps, you again then assess the baby. You see if the baby is apneic or gasping, that is the baby is taking gasp. Is the, if the baby's heart rate is less than 100, if no, that is the baby is not gasping, baby is not apneic and the baby's heart rate is not less than 100, that is the baby's heart rate is more than 100, then you go to the next red box, which is again a question box. Is the baby having labored breathing or is the baby sinosis? If the answer to this is yes, the baby is not happening but is having labored breathing or is having sinuses, you again position the airway, suction if needed and put the baby on a pulse oximeter. Where do you put the pulse oximeter? On the preductal hand. That is the right hand. And you can supply the baby oxygen or CPAP if needed. Now, if the baby is actually apneic, gasping or heart rate is less than 100, you would Go ahead and start your uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation. That is, you start your bagging and you keep reassessing the heart rate. If the baby is still, uh, heart rate is still less than 100, you may tube the baby. If the heart rate falls less than 60, you may need to start chest compressions and adrenaline. Now, this is the box that I was mentioning about. 
this box tells us what are the target saturations uh, now this may you, you may some of you may find very surprising but even if a baby is saturating 80% at 5 minutes it is still okay these are the normal saturations when the baby is born it is okay for a baby to have 50 to 60% saturations immediately at birth if we remember we had discussed about the fetal circulation and how the deoxygenated blood is bypassing through the ductus to come to the descending out and go to the rest of the body. So it takes some time for the ductus to close and the baby to get normal saturations. So these are all transient saturations which will come up gradually. So you do not need to worry, start oxygen, start intubating the baby if the saturations are in these ranges. These are the accepted target oxygen saturations in the preductal hand. Even if we need resuscitation, there is a box which tells us how much FIO2 we need to provide. We need to start resuscitation. So, uh, near term baby, late preterms, more than 35 weeks, we can start in air. We do not need to uh, attach extra additional oxygen. Whereas a preterm baby less than 35 weeks, we can still start with 21 or we can start with 30%. There's it's still okay. okay. So, with this brief background, we'll now go to discuss the uh, initial steps in detail. So, for most vigorous term and preterm newborns, clamping the umbilical cord should be delayed for at least 30 to 60 seconds. All newborns require a rapid evaluation. Ask if the baby's term has good muscle tone, is breathing. If answer is no to any of these, the newborn should be brought to the radiant warmer for the initial steps. And as we have discussed, the initial steps are providing warmth to the baby, drying the baby, stimulating, positioning the head and neck to open the airway and clearing the secretions from the airway if needed. Now, visual assessment of sinuses is not a reliable indicator. And that is why we need to use pulse oximeter and look at the target uh, oxygen saturation levels. Uh, when do we need uh, to do that is when resuscitation is anticipated, when it's a non vigorous baby. To confirm your perception of persistent sinosis, if you give supplemental oxygen, definitely you need to apply a pulse oximeter. And if positive pressure ventil ventilation is required, then we need to use pulse oximeter. So these are the four times when you will need to use a pulse oximeter. For the rest of the vigorous babies, you may not need to use a pulse oximeter and you can go ahead and... Uh, do the resuscitation, NRP algorithm is safe to go ahead without a pulse oximeter. Now, there, there has been, since last couple of changes, uh, updates in the NRP uh, guidelines, they have repeatedly commented about the meconium stained amniotic fluids. If the baby is born with a meconium stained amniotic fluid, the baby and baby is not vigorous, the initial uh, thoughts were we can do a uh, undercord suctioning, we can do suctioning as soon as the baby's head is out. But uh, what we now say is routine laryngoscopy with or without intubation for tracheal suctioning is not suggested. Unless, obviously, if you can see copious secretion sitting in the airway, you can suction it, but you do not necessarily need to intubate and uh, do undercord suctioning for all meconium stain amniotic fluid. The umbilical cord. Now, we have been talking about the umbilical cord management plan and why delayed umbilical cord clamping is recommended. So this is just a pictorial way of depicting what happens if we clamp immediately at birth. So the there's a lot of blood which could have gone to the baby but because now we have clamped and separated the placenta to the baby this cannot happen and the placenta which is going to be thrown away in the dustbin has a lot of packed cells, RBCs, blood whereas the baby is not receiving that additional blood. This is very graphic. Even if we do immediate cord clamping, we do not have pale white babies like this. It is obviously just to emphasize on how it is uh, important to do delayed cord clamping. One minute later, this is the, this is how the baby would be. And two minutes later, this is how the placenta is devoid of all the RBCs and bloods and the baby gets it. So baby gets that additional 20 to 30 ml per kilo of body volume or uh, blood volume if we do delayed cord clamping. Uh, mark the time of birth by starting a timer when the last fetal part emerges from the body's mother's body. In preterm newborns, 
potential benefits of delayed cord clamping compared with immediate cord clamping include decreasing the chance of needing medications to support blood pressures requiring lesser number of blood transfusions and improved survival uh there is a, a certain uh, scenarios where we see higher uh, chances higher uh, requirement of phototherapy or jaundice whereas in term and late preterm babies delayed cord clamping may improve early hematologic measurements although uncertain there may be benefits for neurodevelopmental outcomes which are yet not proven but obviously there is no harm except that there is an increased chance of babies needing phototherapy for hyperbilirubinemia uh early clamping is um, we have already discussed but i'll just tell you the scenarios where we may not do uh, early delayed uh, delayed clamping so early clamping is indicated when the placental circulation is not intact and we are worried that instead of the mother baby may be losing a lot of blood so cases where there is placental abruption bleeding placenta previa bleeding vasa previa or cord avulsion are the places where you do not do delayed cord clamping most delayed cord clamping studies have excluded multiple gestations so there are no recommendations for them and iugr babies abnormal umbilical artery doppler abnormal placentation and other situation where uterine utero placental perfusion or umbilical cord blood flow are affected uh, such scenarios uh, a delayed cord clamping is not recommended yet but definitely this should be discussed in umbilical cord management plan should be a part of every delivery between there should be a discussion between the pediatrician and the obstetrician so that this is discussed and we make a plan and we can try to do in delayed cord clamping in as many babies as clinically indicated so now rapid evaluation again term tone and crying is are the three questions that we uh, ask ourselves when assessing the baby and initial assessments uh, initial steps of resuscitation as we have discussed provide warm now how do we provide warm uh we uh, there's uh, usually all the baby uh, uh, all the uh, delivery areas where we are expected to resuscitate baby should have a radiant warmer so that the resuscitation team can easily access the warmer and have the baby in the radiant warmer causing a uh, least heat loss we should leave the baby uncovered to allow full visualization and to permit the radiant heat to reach the baby if we anticipate that the baby will remain under the warmer for more than a few minutes we can put the baby on a servo control mode and apply the a uh, temperature sensor to the baby otherwise we can just use a manual mode there is no problem with that uh, what we should avoid is hypothermia and overheating we should aim to have a euthermic baby hypothermia as well as overheating hypothermic baby are known to have poor outcomes in terms of neonatal morbidity and mortality very relevant very important to have a warm baby now drying the skin we should not be very vigorous and the aim should be to not harm the baby so wet skin increases evaporative losses so what we are expected to do is place the baby on a warm towel or a blanket we should ensure that we have at least two or three sets of dry linen so that once we wipe uh, wipe the baby dry the baby we should change that linen and use another pre warmed dry linen for continued drying drying is not necessary for very preterm babies babies who are born less than 32 weeks because they should be covered immediately in polyethylene plastic which reduces the ev evaporative heat loss and having these babies under a warmer is good enough opening up the plastic cover again and again to dry the baby does not help it defeats the purpose of keeping the baby warm and causes significant amount of heat loss so we should not be doing that stimulating the baby is just gently rubbing the baby's back trunk or extremities and never shaking a baby so over uh, overly vigorous stimulation is not helpful and can cause significant birth traumas and we have seen those uh, bleeds in the brain and head so we should avoid that positioning the airway so positioning is uh, uh, of the airway is just uh, good enough to maintain that the airway is open and uh, uh, optimally uh, uh, positioned we should not have uh, hyper extensions or flexions of the neck because these positions may interfere with the air entry and collapse the airway so to help maintain the correct position we may place a small rolled towel under the baby shoulder shoulder pad and uh, that should help or we can just put some uh, this thing to avoid uh, edema for premature baby specifically clearing secretions so uh, all vigorous term babies do not need a uh, routine suctioning 
only if we can see copious secretions in the airway which the baby cannot clear on its own is when we do uh, oral nasal suctioning and as i mentioned it should always be oral followed by nasal or as uh, we can see m before n so because uh, once you do the oral suctioning uh, uh, while you are doing the nasal suctioning and if the baby uh, gets stimulated and uh, sucks in all that is there in the oral cavity it all goes if it is meconium the baby will have meconium aspiration if it is amnio uh, amniotic fluid it will go in so it is easier and safer to do the oral suctioning followed by nasal suctioning it should be gentle enough the suction pressure should be between 80 to 100 aim is to clear the secretions not to cause trauma not to cause a vagal response leading to bradycardia apnea or any traumatic bleeding evaluate response of this so after uh, we have done the initial steps as we are aware we would do the uh, 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 quick immediate check uh, response of the baby if the baby is still apneic or gasping uh, a gasping baby does not have effective uh, breathing, so we should be treating it same as apnea. And as we said, if the answer is no, that the baby is not apneic or gasping, if the heart rate is more than 100, we should uh, look at the type of breathing, saturations, and consider oxygen or CPAP if needed. Uh, during neonatal resuscitation, ventilation of the baby's lungs is the most important and effective step during uh, the resuscitation unlike the adults and pediatric age group because here the lungs are filled with fluids and that is what we want to clear and we know that heart and everything else is is coping well as soon as we take care of the lungs the rest of the things will take care of themselves so if the baby is breathing after the initial steps assess the heart rate if it is more than 100 uh, if it is less than 100 we may need to start positive pressure ventilation we should have a, a a move bag handy and we can uh, we should start it if needed but otherwise if the baby is breathing it may be distressed it may be a labored breathing there may be sinuses but if the baby is breathing not gasping heart rate is more than 100 we should move to the next step we should we we, we don't need the ambu bag and we don't need the uh the, to go to the advanced steps we can simply start the baby on some respiratory support see like a cpap or niv uh, now, how to determine the baby's heart rate? Uh, a few very simple text, tricks is to uh, use a stethoscope. We have tried different things, including your uh, umbilical pulsations, not, uh, not very reliable. The pulses anywhere, they are not reliable in new neonates. Heart rate is best auscultated with a stethoscope. What they have also recommended is a single lead or a, a three lead ECG. Obviously, not uh, appropriate in our settings, but then using just a stethoscope is the best. If you have two person team, the other person who is assessing the heart rate can either listen yeah. and tap as and when there is a a, a, a beat. It can give you a very good idea. Uh, so, as you said, if the baby is breathing, heart rate is more than hundred. Baby is sinus, we put the uh, saturation probe on the right hand because it is the preductal, and then we can assess if the baby needs excess oxygen or not, or we can uh, decide if the baby needs uh, CPAP. As uh, this we have discussed before, when do we need pulse oximeter? If we are anticipating resuscitation to confirm uh, the perception of sinuses. If you are giving oxygen, if you are starting positive pressure ventilation, definitely we need to have pulse oximeter on in these four scenarios. So we have discussed this in detail. Uh, these are the targeted preductal saturations. We as as far as the baby is in these ranges, we do not need to worry and we do not need to start uh, supplemental oxygen. This we have discussed. Um, now, putting an ambu bag just on the uh, and sealing the uh, baby uh, is not equivalent to a CPAP. And if we are intending to give CPAP, we need to have a CPAP machine or a CPAP proper CPAP should be available in the labor room or in the nursery. Uh, meconium stained amniotic fluid. The presence of meconium stained amniotic fluid may indicate fetal distress, and it uh, uh, indicates that the, this baby may require. Uh, resuscitation after birth. So at least two 
qualified people who can initiate resuscitation should be present at such deliveries. Uh, routine uh, intubations under cord suctioning again are not recommended anymore. If a baby is born through meconium stained amniotic fluid and has depressed respiration or poor muscle tone, we should aim to bring the baby to the radiant warmer and perform initial steps as any other baby. We are running short of time. I'll, we have just done this, but I won't go through all the questions, just some relevant ones. Which image shows the correct way to optimize the baby's airway? Is it A, B or C? Again, as we can see, C is flexing it too much. It may constrict the airway. A will again constrict the airway because it is hyperextending the airway, hyperextending the neck. The ideal position is B, like a sniffing in the morning. Now, to end, I just wanted to share this slide and tell you what are the relevant uh, changes, updates between the previous and the new uh, uh, editions of the NRP algorithm. So the first and foremost is umbilical cord management plan has been added to the four pre-birth questions to the option editions. So it is very important, very relevant. And one of the things that should take focus and we should start implementing it, the umbil umbilical cord management plan, which has been introduced in the eighth edition, which has come recently. The another one is initial steps reordered to better reflect the common practice. That is initially it was warm position, airway, clear secretions and dry and then stimulate. Instead, it is just rationalized and it is put there what we routinely do. We would warm and dry and stimulate the baby before we go ahead with the position and suctioning. So just change the sequence. Uh, electronic cardiac monitor is recommended earlier in the algorithm, which was not there. Uh, I uh, personally don't feel it is still appropriate in our setting and we can still make do with the uh, uh, stethoscope. Epinephrine or flush volume is increased 0.5 to 1 ml. Now it is increased to 3 ml normal slime just to make sure that we do not lose volumes in the umbilical uh, vein because if, if, it, if it all we put umbilical catheters to do these resuscitation, the umbilical catheter itself is 20 to 30 centimeters long and just 0.5 ml to 1 ml of flush may not be adequate. Epinephrine, IV or endotracheal have been simplified for uh, efficiency. The dose range is unchanged. The simplified dose is uh, within the recommended dosing range and additional research is needed but then more or less it remains the same instead of a range now they are giving a number it was 0.01 to 0.03 now it is 0.02 and 0.2 ml per kilo so nothing much has changed here and expanded time frame for cesarean uh, of uh, cessation of resuscitative uh, resuscitative effort so when to end uh, resuscitation initially it was 10 minutes now they have extended it to 20 minutes which i uh, feel is very fair uh, for the baby, we uh, 10 minutes is too early to call it off and stop resuscitation, resuscitating. So we should give at least 20 minutes before we call it uh, uh, still one or before we say that, okay, we could not salvage the baby. So these are the things that I, I think are very relevant and we had to discuss. Uh, if we want to discuss anything else, any questions, we can take it now or at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakul. Um, we'll be open to taking any questions if we have for Dr. Nakul. Well, Looks like we do not have uh, any questions coming his way. Um, I would therefore take this opportunity to um, welcome our next speaker for the day, um, Dr. Nisha Krishnamurthy. Um, Dr. Nisha Krishnamurthy is, <coughs> um, she has pursued her fellowship in pediatric nephrology from the International Pediatric Nephrology Association um, at the Bai Jai Bai Wadia Hospital for Children in Mumbai. 
Um, she did her MD pediatrics from the Government Medical College and Hospital in Nagpur. Uh, she has had uh, immense experience in treating children with nephrotic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, transplant, pre and post patients, urology and urinary tract infections. Um, she has also managed children with acute and chronic renal problems and various complica uh, complications like uh, hypertensive emergencies, pulmonary edema, uh, metabolic ac acidosis, etc. Um, she has led a team of residents during the final year and was given the opportunity of decision making in the line of management and treatment of the admitted patients. So uh, I think with this immense experience, I'll um, welcome Dr. Nisha Krishnamurthy to give a talk. Welcome, Nisha. Thank you, Saurav. Thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'll be taking you all through this uh, topic of nocturnal enuresis and voiding dysfunction. Um, bladder has always been a little bit challenging to understand and to treat. So today, um, I hope to be able to make it a little simpler and easier for all to understand. So what we need to... Um, yeah, sorry about that. So normally, uh, we all know that bladder is something, the development and the maturation of which occurs over a period of time after birth, wherein the infant has a incontinent bladder or something which is an involuntary voiding rather. And over a period of time, they learn to develop and be continent and which may take as long as even four years for daytime urinary continence. And nighttime urinary continence, which occurs a little later, is achieved by around five to seven years. And urinary continence on the whole is achieved usually after achieving adequate and successful bowel continence. Now, what is important to understand is that in the process of development of normal voiding and uh, storage functions of the bladder, we look at various aspects. One is the increasing capacity of the bladder. Second is the improving coordination of the bladder as well as the sphincter in terms of what relaxes when the other contracts and the decreasing frequency of uh, incontinence and improvement in the bladder control over a period of time. So typically we understand that, and as a rough calculation, we know how to calculate the bladder capacity for a child anywhere between the age of two to 16 years. That's a very simple formula where we do age plus two into 30. And then there, is, there are also these values which can be used for newborns up to the age of the first two to three years. Now, what is important uh, to understand is the um, how is it that the bladder plays a role along with the spinal cord and the higher cortical centers in order to maintain this very complex interaction between the autonomic and the somatic nerves to make the urination or the storage of urine happen. So the bottom line or what is important in terms of the bladder's function is that it should be able to store urine at a low pressure but a high outlet resistance whereby there is no leak of urine and at the phase of voiding it should be able to have a low outlet resistance with a sustained detrusor contraction. Now we have to understand that the bladder function is primarily of two parts. One is the filling phase which is largely controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. A simple way of understanding or remembering is sympathetic S for storage. So therefore, in this, what happens is that there are these beta receptors which are present over the detrusor in the fundus of the bladder, which when activated, allow to keep the bladder relaxed. And there are alpha receptors which are present at the neck of the bladder, which when activated, allow the contraction of the bladder neck and there are these pudendal nerves which keep the um, external sphincter contracted. So therefore there is a filling which occurs at which time there is a low pressure in the bladder where we expect that the uh, pressure of the water does not exceed, uh, sorry, pressure does not exceed more than 30 centimeters of water when the bladder is filled to capacity. If the pressure goes high, it can tend to damage the kidneys. Now the second phase of the bladder's function is the voiding phase at which when the bladder has reached its full capacity, the mechanoreceptors are activated and the parasympathetic, again, as an acronym to remember, P for parasympathetic and P for peeing, parasympathetic nervous system is involved in the voiding phase of the bladder. So then what happens is that there is a parasympathetic outflow that comes through the splanchnic nerves. It contracts the detrusor muscle. Simultaneously, there is an inhibition of the bladder neck contraction, therefore there's a relaxation of the bladder neck and the pudendal nerve supply is inhibited, which means there is a relaxation of the external sphincter as well. 
all these put together allow in a adequate voiding typically an infant voids multiple times in a day maybe around 20 25 times in a day but this is largely a spinal reflex and the cortical inhibition as which occurs with um, the growth of the child in maturation is something which comes a little later so now that we know what is the normal voiding we can go on to understand what is the voiding dysfunction so any when i say dysfunction what i mean is that when the bladder is unable to perform the above described method of filling and emptying that will come under the category of voiding dysfunction now it is then therefore obvious that the alteration or the dysfunction can occur at various levels it can be because of an alteration of the innervation of the bladder or the external sphincter or a, a difficulty in the uh, there is a problem with the compliance or there is a low or high uh, bladder capacity there is a dysfunction of the detrusor muscle there could be some sort of uh, obstruction at the bladder outlet and these causes can either be neurogenic anatomic or functional when i say neurogenic i mean some maybe congenital issues like spinal dysraphisms there could be spinal cord trauma when i say anatomic i mean possibilities of posterior valves there could be an ectopic um, insertion of the ureter at the bladder neck or below which means there is continuous dribbling of the urine or there could be a vesicouretric reflux the functional causes are not because of any anatomical or neurological as the name suggests but it is because of a delay in the maturation of this system which means there could be some delay because there's a global developmental delay and that also manifests in the form of a uh, voiding dysfunction or what is very commonly seen as constipation and abnormal toilet training habits now when we talk about the pediatric urinary incontinence now it is largely divided and also for the ease of understanding is divided into a nighttime enuresis or nighttime incontinence and the daytime incontinence they are not mutually exclusive exclusive but just to for a, to help us understand so daytime incontinence is something which we can label a child as having only after the age of 5 years and that too if they have more than two such um, episodes happening once in at least a two week span in children younger than that it cannot be yet called incontinence because they are still in the process of achieving the normal maturation so typically what causes uh, daytime urinary incontinence now just to lay, uh, name them it is an either an overactive bladder it could be a postponement mechanisms where the child refuses to void on time it could be a dysfunctional voiding or it could be certain other conditions like say giggle incontinence or vaginal voiding or a bladder nest, uh, neck dysfunction i'll just go into what each of them means when i say overactive bladder i mean that the uh, when in the filling phase of the bladder we've understood earlier that the blad the detrusor has to remain uh, non contract it should not be contracting at that time and therefore it should allow the filling of the bladder from the urine that is being continuously produced by the kidneys but however if there are these abnormal contraction of the detrusor which keep occurring it may cause the child to have a very classical symptom of urgency which means the child wants to again and again and again go and pass urine which are usually small in quantity because he is not given enough time to fill the bladder to capacity at all and because there is this frequent urge many of them may actually present with these holding maneuvers whereby they may cross their leg or they may sit down or they may hold the perineum to try and prevent those voids it is usually seen that children who have an overactive bladder may have associated issues of constipation or fecal incontinence or urinary tract infections the other other end is something called the voiding postponement wherein what happens is that the bladder is now the child for whatever reason chooses not to uh, pass urine at the time that it should be passing urine and they tend to hold on to the urine so therefore their vo voiding frequency is very low normally we would accept a voiding frequency of anywhere about 4 to 8 times in a day as normal depending on the water intake as well but if the voiding frequency is less than 3 times which means that this child is habitually postponing maturation as one of the possibilities there could be some behavioral issues so what happens is that the bladder goes on holding the urine and it is going on distending after a point the detrusor then becomes hypoactive and weak and then refuses to contract and completely void or empty the bladder at that point 
Thereby, we land up with a bladder which is overstretched, hypoactive, so much so that we may even have a myogenic failure. And these bladders, because of the inability to void completely, always have some residual urine in them and thereby putting them at a higher risk for urinary tract infections. The third category of a voiding dysfunction is a dysfunctional voiding. What this means is that normally when we void, the detrusa has to contract, the external sphincter and the bladder neck and the pelvic flow muscles have to relax so that there is a free flow of the urine out of the bladder. But however, if for whatever reason, the external sphincter doesn't uh, relax, if the pelvic flow muscles do not relax, or if the bladder neck does not, then there is a counterproductive action of the detrusor contraction against a closed outlet. So therefore, this kind of voiding will become a very periodic voiding. It will take a child a long time to void that much of urine, and it is a start-stop, start-stop sort of a pattern. Now, if there are neurological lesions which are explaining why this has happened, it is, of course, a neurogenic bladder. But if there is no neurological lesion, but however the bladder chooses to behave like this, it is then caused, it is called a um, Hinman-Allen syndrome, a syndrome in the most severe part. So these kind of bladders tend to be high pressure bladders and therefore the chances of hydroeurytronephrosis or subsequent kidney damage is quite high in these children. The other, uh, what we must remember is that voiding dysfunctions may have associations. Either it may be associated with the UTI. It has been difficult to tell whether it is a cause and effect sort of a thing, what came first. But likely it is assumed that the bladder dysfunction has led to a UTI because of chronic retention of urine and the bladder colonization in the post-void residues. There is also an association of this with the VUR. Now, when the bladder is got, suppose if it is a high pressure bladder, it is likely that it is going to reflux the urine upwards into the higher systems. So these children therefore have a high, higher grade of VUR. They may have a higher incidence of urinary tract infections. And also the VUR may take a longer time to resolve. And in such children, if a surgical management is undertaken, it is, there is a likelihood of failure of the surgical management because the bladder issue has not been dealt with. Bowel bladder dysfunction. This is something which almost always goes hand in hand together with a large number of children, almost 30 to 88 percent of children who have bladder dysfunctions are associated to have bowel dysfunction as well. Now, the thought process behind this, this is that if there is a rectal distension because of constipation, it is going to apply some pressure on the posterior bladder wall because there is only so much space in the pelvis and therefore it is going to cause some premature distrusor contractions. Or it can be thought of one of the reasoning is that the urethral and the anal sphincter neural input is a single unit. And also, if there is a uh, prolonged accumulation of stool, what happens is that there are these inappropriate pelvic flow contractions. There is this inappropriate um, relaxation or contraction of the urethral sphincter, along with the dyssynergy of the detrusor muscle. All put together is going to manifest in the form of a dysfunctional voiding. Now, when we, now that we've understood what goes on in the bladder and what could be contributing factors, when we look at a child, how do we start? How do we get to the diagnosis of what is it that we're dealing with? So what's important is that to get an idea, to get a history. Some of the basic questions that we need to understand or to ask is what is the voiding schedule like? Does the child void too much or too less? At each void, is there a lot of volume or is just a few drops, but because of a high frequency, it seems like a lot of voiding. And in between these intervals, in between these periods of voiding, what is the, is there any incontinence episodes? Are there any episodes where the child has wet himself or herself? The other symptoms which we have to look forward, uh, look for are if there's any urgency, by which I mean the child has got a strong sense of desire to void at that point, and they may not even be able to wait to reach a washroom. They may wet their clothes. Is there hesitancy? This is because the child wants to void, but because of some sort of dysenergy, some sort of uh, mix and match between the detrusor contraction and the uh, outlet forces, there is hesitancy. The child is unable to void. There is dribbling. This could be seen in some ectopic ureter-like conditions. 
there is straining for example when there is a lazy bladder and the child has to do a valsalva maneuver whether the abdominal pressure is is going to be aiding the uh, bladder evacuation there could be interrupted or a poor stream which is commonly seen in posterior valves and there are these holding maneuvers which the child tries to do to compensate for an overactive bladder very important and mandatory as a part of our evaluation has to be the bowel habits what is the diet like and what is the fluid intake and the water intake like also important is the past history whether the child has had an uneventful or an eventful neonatal perinatal period was there any chance of some birth asphyxia or some other event which may have a role to play in how the bladder is behaving right now many a times it is seen that in those family histories where there have been delayed uh, achieve there has been a delay in achieving the urinary uh, continence sometimes it passes on to children and although i will come back to it at a later time nocturnal enuresis has got a very strong genetic predominance similarly if there is a history of urinary tract infections that could be the reason for the badly behaved bladder or it could have been the uh, so effect of a badly behaved uh, bladder last but not the least we must always evaluate whether there are any stressors at home because many a times children may uh, manifest uh, uh, the reaction to a stress by having some voiding issues so typically once we have got a history and we know which way to go on an examination we must be able to look for things like a presacral pre presacral dimple some tuft of hair a lipoma we have to evaluate the um, uh, sensations over the perianal area the rectal tone whether or not there is presence of labial adhesions whether phimosis in boys or and also we must evaluate the lower limb power and the deep tendon reflexes once we have done that and now we've got a fair idea of whether we are looking at a filling defect or an emptying uh, voiding defect we also do some urine uh, tests along with certain imaging modalities to understand exactly what are we looking at so when we are doing an ultrasound what we are looking at is the kidney sizes whether there is any presence of a hydrouretral nephrosis whether the, what is the size of the bladder wall is it thickened is it normal are there evidence of any cystitis are there any uh, diverticuli are there any saculations whether there is any evidence of uh, posterior valves more importantly mcu would be a better test to identify that where in an mcu with the in installation of dye we look at the delineation of the posterior urethra we look at the bladder we look at the contours we are able to see if there's any reflux happening in the filling phase or in the voiding phase we are able to see if there is the um, there is any post void residue when the child voids and we can figure out because of the retention of dye in the bladder also some investigations like the mri of the spine will help us understand if there are some spinal dysraphisms which may be contributing to this kind of bladder issues the other group of investigations include the uroflow metries and the urodynamics the point of which is to see in uroflow metry we look at the flow rates we look at the maximum voided volume and we see the time at which the child has voided that much volume in urodynamics we look at the pressures of the bladder of the how the detrusor contractions the abdominal pressures we look at what is the voided volume how much time was taken all this in put together no one investigation can answer all the questions but when we have a combination of these it will give us a fairly good idea of what kind of bladder we are dealing with so now that we have understood what is the history we have examined the child we have done all these bunch of investigations and we have got a fair idea of what is it that we are dealing with how do we manage this most often than not some basic uh, rules have to be maintained prior to getting into the more invasive management of the bladder because unless we deal with these simple but extremely important points our further treatment may actually fall flat it may not help us so what's important is a the child has to have an adequate water intake whatever is appropriate for that age they have to have a habit of timed and regular voiding this is something the importance of which has to be stressed to the child if they are at an age at which they can understand and definitely to the parents as to the importance of timed and regular voiding which is usually around every 2 to 3 hours the voiding posture is something which may we may overlook but has a very important role to play for example if the girl sits and she's does not move her legs wide apart 
she may have something and an older child who's toilet trained may still have some signs of incontinence like for example the vaginal voiding because when the legs are not moved apart the stream of the urine cannot be free so therefore we may have to teach them to sit facing the flush tank so that they have to mandatorily move their leg wide apart to allow for a free flow of urine children must be taught the importance to not wait till the last minute before they pass urine and that they should go when they have start feeling a sense to or, or a desire to void and in certain conditions like the underactive bladder we were expecting that the bladder is the bladder muscles are too weak to co uh, contract by themselves they may actually benefit by something called the double voiding in which we ask the child to pass urine then again in a few minutes to again sit and pass urine so that we void to completion treatment of constipation now the importance of this cannot be stressed more it is extremely vital as a part of our management of voiding this function to not have constipation complicating the issue which means that the child has to have a good water intake adequate fiber in the diet uh, and a regular bowel movement that is to be planned according to the child's schedule also what will help is to reduce the intake of substances that kind kind of irritate the bladder more for example like caffeine or spicy foods or orange juice and things like that what can also help is if you avoid bubble baths and washing with soap in the perineal areas because sometimes that may lead to urethritis or vaginitis which can kind of worsen the existing problems because a child may prefer not to void so as to avoid these irritation uh, or feeling of a dysuria so when we kind of tackle these basic points then we move on to the next step of therapy in uh, voiding this function where we have a whole bunch of medications which we can use depending upon the problem we're trying to deal with if you're dealing with an overactive bladder oh, if you're dealing with an overactive bladder the problem is that the bladder is contracting too much and too soon so therefore the solution to that will be to treat with anticholinergics which are usually the n3 muscarinic inhib um, inhibitors which act by suppressing these contractions therefore drugs like oxybutynin help because they help in increasing the bladder capacity and decreasing the frequent contractions on the other hand if we have something like an underactive or a lazy bladder then after we have tried the initial uh, methods as we've just spoken about what may help in certain cases is the clean intermittent catheterizations if there are conditions where there is a, a dysenergia if there is an issue with the bladder outlet relaxation or the pelvic flow um, bladder neck relaxation or pelvic flow muscle relaxations there drugs like alpha antagonists may help and they can also be augmented with things like biofeedback mechanisms where the child will under video and under vision understands at what point do they have to relax their pelvic muscles so as to be able to pass urine easily the other options of course include surgical methods like bladder augmentations but these are steps which we come to after we have tried the step 1 of uh, behavioral modifications the second part of pharmacotherapy and then we come on to surgical step so what is important and a take home message for this part of the talk will be it always has to be a step wise approach where no problem should be dealt as a, something too simple or too mundane everything and every single aspect of an approach to bladder is extremely important now just to talk about nocturnal enuresis which was a second part of the uh, pediatric urinary incontinence now typically when there is urinary incontinence that occurs in child in sleep after the age of 5 years this comes under the category of nocturnal enuresis it can be accepted that up to 5 to 7 years the children may have episodes of bedwetting and they usually tend to grow out of this as they grow older now nocturnal enuresis can be an independent entity by itself where it is only monosymptomatic that means they have no other symptoms of the lower urinary tract as we have discussed earlier or they may be polysymptomatic as in in combination with the daytime urinary incontinence as well now typically nocturnal enuresis is divided into two groups one being primary in which the child has never achieved nighttime control and therefore they continue to have it for much longer than their peers 
The second is the secondary enuresis in which they've had a period in which they were dry and they did not have nighttime wetting, but they again started having these complaints after a span of at least six months to be called as secondary. So when I say non-monosymptomatic, which means they have other lower urinary tract infections like urgency, hesitancy, dribbling, straining, increased frequency, a weak stream, holding maneuvers, or some post-micturition dribble or dysurias or lower abdominal pains. Now, when we talk about nocturnal enuresis, there are certain features that we must remember. One being that this could be just a delay and in some children, they just take longer to achieve the same level of maturation. There could be genetic factors. Like for example, there are certain genes that are actually associated with this, or it is seen as a family trait. If one of the parents had the similar issue, 50% chances that the child also could. Something called the nocturnal polyuria. And how do we understand nocturnal polyuria? If the child passes more than 130% of the expected bladder capacity at one time at night, it can be counted as nocturnal polyuria. There has been a lot of research in which it is thought that the ADH levels in certain, some of these children are low. Therefore, they are more prone to bedwetting as compared to the others. Sometimes a disturbed sleep pattern, sleep apnea syndromes, and a small bladder capacity, all these together can play a role in nocturnal enuresis. We must also remember that adding to these problems could also be issues like chronic kidney disease, urinary tract infections, posterior valves, diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus because of the polyuria, seizure disorders, all of these could also have nocturnal enuresis as a part of their presenting complaints. Now, when we are evaluating children for nocturnal enuresis, we have a certain process or a certain um, list that we must kind of go through in our mind so as to not miss anything. So we can ask a few questions that need, that need to be answered. Like for example, is it just nocturnal enuresis and no other lower urinary tract symptoms? Was it a primary uh, enuresis or is it secondary enuresis? Because that again has difference in the approach. How often do these wetting episodes happen? We would like to have a fluid intake diary. For example, how much water does the child drink in the few hours prior to falling asleep? When they void, what is the quantity of void? I mean, what is the voided volume? How often do they void? How many times do they void? So all these details when we put together is called a maintaining the voiding diary. Whether there's an associated constipation that comes along with these complaints. And very important is additional medical histories. There's any diabetes mellitus or insipidus or seizure disorders. And of course, the developmental evaluation because our approach to a bladder case will then vary. As we've already mentioned before, the family history and what interventions have been attempted by the family so far to tackle these problems. We must understand that there are certain goals of management of nocturnal enuresis. Why goals? Because A, we need to understand what is it that the family expects out of this. Do they want that? Do they understand that this is something age related? It may change with time. Is it that they're looking at it as some sort of failure on their part or on the child's part and that the enuresis is some sort of a mistake the child is making? Or do we have to understand, do, we, do they want that the doctor's job is to just keep the child dry because there is some event coming up like a sleepover or a picnic or some such. So we need to understand what does what does the family expect out of it and what is their level of motivation in dealing with this problem. So before beginning the therapy, as I just told you, we have to define what is the expectation from the child if he or she is old enough and of course from the parents. We must ensure that this does not add on to the stress because that is not going to help us in achieving anything. We must counsel the family that the treatment of nocturnal enuresis is not a one or two day thing. It is actually a little bit long term and we may not even achieve the entire success with the first method. We might, be to, we might have to move on to the second and third options or modalities of treatment. And it is extremely important that the family along with the child are motivated and are willing to participate and fully understand what all is going to be involved in this therapy. And of course, follow-up is a must. So we, we explain to the family what they're looking at. And that in most of the children, it actually resolves by the time they grow up. 
and it is not the child or the caregiver's fault that the aneurysm is happening to them what can be done is that because bedwetting can be a lot of it can be so embarrassing for the child we can help them use and teach them small small things like using bed protection washable or disposable products using room deodorizers thoroughly washing the child and dressing them if this has happened and using emollient so that the child does not get any rash so we must teach the child that they should attempt to void regularly during the day they they should limit their water intake to uh, two hours prior to going to uh, sleep they must void once before they go to sleep they should avoid high caffeine and high sugar based drinks especially in the evening time and then if we are uh, the child is using diapers we should kind of dissuade from that because using a diaper gives them a false sense of security and delays this whole process of bladder maturation so one of the therapies that can be used is the alarm therapy in which there is a sensor that is attached to the child and then there is an alarm which helps to awaken the child it can either be an auditory alarm or it can be a vibration alarm the point of this is that it is to teach the child that every time he starts to void when he's in deep sleep the sensor will get activated it will wake the child up but this method is successful only if the child fully wakes up from sleep he himself shuts the he himself or herself they shut off the alarm they go to the bathroom void to completion come back if there was any soiling of the clothes they clean it they clean the sensor put it back and then go to then go to sleep this habit over a period of time will then help them understand that they're going to void even before they wet themselves so alarm therapy is something which you have to give time for the child to get adapted to for the child to then understand and our response to this therapy cannot be something which we evaluate over a week or two but it has to be something that is done over a month or two and once we get a consecutive two weeks of dry nights without any incontinence episode we can consider it as a successful outcome now alarm therapy of all the therapies is the most successful because you're training the child to get up and void and it's most likely to have the least relapse rates the other options which are more of a short term benefit are drugs like desmopressin acetate which is an analog of the antidiuretic hormone now since it is believed that there is a deficiency or a lesser amount of adh that is being secreted in these child in these children during their deep sleep it is then thought that if we supplement the adh it might help prevent these episodes so there was the option of nasal spray versus a tablet but however tablets are thought to be more useful and safer to use in such children they are most valuable when you're using them for short term benefits for example sorry for example if the child has to go for a picnic or a sleepover these can be very useful there are of course some side effects like a headache or abdominal pain or nasal stuffiness etc also things like the nasal spray may not work if the child has already got a case of rhinitis because the absorption then becomes erratic the other option is the uh, tricyclic antidepressant imipramine which is again although we're not sure how it acts but it is shown to be beneficial in especially in long term uh, sorry short term uh, effect and the dose can be depending upon the age of the child they do have uh, their own set of side effects like changes in personality or emotional ability and irritability etc but these drugs are if you compare to the alarm therapy they are less effective and the chances of relapse are definitely higher with these drugs versus alarm therapies now when we have done all this and in spite of which we see that there is absolutely no response to the intervention or let's put it as less than 50% improvement from our baseline of symptoms then we might have to look at something that we are missing maybe we uh, the child did not respond to it because you have tried three months of alarm therapy you have tried desmopressin at the right dose there has been a combination of alarm and desmopressin and still we have not achieved what we wanted to so the possibilities is that there is an overactive bladder we are missing an underlying disease which is causing polyuria and that has nothing to do with the bladder or there is an inconsistent or an incorrect use of our therapies there is a constipation issue that we have not dealt with so once we understand what are we looking at once we have made it clear to the parents what is the expectation that we have from the therapies that we have used and we have ruled out or rather dealt with all the other associated complaints 
the likelihood of us achieving a satisfactory result in the treatment of enuresis is higher. So thank you very much for a very patient listening. Thanks a lot. I'll be happy to take any questions if there are. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Um, so, do we have any questions for Dr. Krishnamurti? Uh, well, if not, then I think uh, we should proceed in welcoming our next speaker for this evening. Great. So I'll take this opportunity to welcome uh, our third speaker for this masterclass, uh, Dr. Nitin Mokul. Dr. Nitin Mokul is a senior pediatric craniofacial and reconstructive plastic surgeon has uh, trained postgraduates in reconstructive plastic surgery following trauma and burns. He has also managed uh, congenital craniofacial deformities like cleft lip and palate, craniosynostosis, uh, TM joint, ankylosis, ear reconstructions, and nose reconstructions. He has been a project director for the Smile Train project, in which he has performed 2,500 procedures till date, free of cost, for treating patients with cleft lip and cleft palate. Dr. Mokal has been a volunteer in Impact India Foundation for operating cleft lip patients on Lifeline Express in remote areas. He has won uh, the first Dr. Ian Jackson's award of ASPI for craniofacial surgery for his work on Pierre Robin anomalies. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mokal, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Shelly Shradade. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will be covering the management of cleft lip and palate. Just a moment, I am able to, I am working on another piece. Just for a second, uh, just hold on. Yeah. Ah. So uh, the causative factors for the cleft lip palate, we all know that a lot of exogenous and endogenous factors which uh, causes failure of fusion and merging of the uh, swelling. And there are a lot of uh, bone morphogenic proteins which are involved in uh, causing the organogenesis in cleft lip and palate. These are all the growth factors which are involved. And uh, you classify the uh, craniofacial anomalies depending upon at what week uh, the anomaly occurs. If it occurs below less than three weeks, it is called as a cerebrocranial dysplasia where the patient presents with a malformation of the brain and cranium. Then cerebrocraniofacial dysplasia where the facial dysplasia involving the hollow prosencephaly within five to to five weeks and the craniofacial dysplasia is where it involves the uh, claps and craniosynosis which is the commonest one then what are the causes of cleft lip and palate the commonest being genetic where the if the parents are uh, having a cleft then the, the baby also develops the cleft another is the patient's mother is in on steroids septoin and other uh, medication x-ray radiation and folic acid and zinc deficiency in uh, embryogenesis, uh, by three weeks, there is a development of the prosencephalic neural wall occurs, and then the two nasal fields, which uh, uh, develops together, and three facial swellings comes together, and then they fuse together to form the upper lip and the lower jaw. 
and the primary pellet is the growth which occurs from the myogenetic uh, mining uh, mesenchyme from six somite it migrate and along with it what carries the fusion now if the uh, if the defect occurs at seventh week then you develop the incomplete left leg if it is sixth week then you develop a complete left leg and pallet same thing if it occurs at the both sides in front of the bilateral incomplete left leg bilateral complete left leg sometimes the failure of the fusion of the lateral nasal processes maxillary processes and middle nasal process causes a rare craniofacial cleft called as a oro naso ocular cleft cleft four also associated with the cleft angular cleft the as soon as the baby is delivered we encourage the breast feeding sometimes we give a obturator for the feeding purpose and we encourage the baby for the breast feeding there are a lot of videos are available on the youtube to help the baby uh, for feeding purpose and then we have advocate the mothers to have a football position or a straddle position where the child is held in a in a vertical position and the nipple goes more into the mesopharyngeal area and then gradually the mother helps in uh, pressing the milk towards his mouth if the breast milk is not adequate in out there you can put the place the patient on a, a bottle feeding and necessary precautions are taken for uh, aseptic precautions are taken to clean the bottles and uh, we cross cut the nipple so that the Uh, the uh, milk can be easily go into the child's mouth. All the family members are taught how to feed the a baby with the help of a bottle. When the baby is three to four months of age, we uh, make uh, do the basic investigations like hemoglobin and uh, preoperative profile, and uh, the hemoglobin should be more than ten, and the weight should be ten pounds. the aim of the cleft lip repair is that we do a uh, repair of the anterior palate repair of the muscle we dissect the nose and bring the nose to its normal level so you can see that on the slide on your right showing the womer flap which is a single layer closure of the anterior palate till the alveolus and then a nose uh, uh, the this is a turbinate flap which is used for the nasal floor area and then we dissect the muscle dissect the nose completely and then we realign the muscle and realign all the anatomical landmarks and do a quilting sutures for the nostril uh, what is the lr transfixation sutures with the five opd suture and bring this nose to its normality so to achieve the symmetry so once uh, this is done then the child is brought for the these are some of the results of the nose and lip which is aligned normally at the first stage then comes the these are some of the results of the bilateral and the symmetry has been achieved this is a midline cleft rare craniofacial cleft and the angular cleft This is the nasoocular cleft where we leave behind a patch of a mucosa to create a naso a nasal lacrimal duct which is draining into the mouth and realign all the musculature. So uh, it is lip along with the uh, nasoocular cleft. Then comes the cleft palate repair. The palate repair though it is a, a physiological operation. We usually do it at the age of Eight months to twelve months of age. That is the time the child starts babbling. The intention of doing a cleft palate repair is to restore the palatal musculature. The palatal musculatures are longitudinally placed and they are attached to the posterior palate and margin. So you need to release those muscles, bring them back, and push them back and realign them in a horizontal direction, called as a, a velopharyngeal. Uh, a uh, closure with the help of a uh, uh, intervelar veloplasty and these are the muscles which are transversely placed which we release them and then we uh, suture them horizontally to give get a good velopharyngeal sphincter which is formed which achieve not only narrowing of the nasopharynx it also uh, narrows the anteroposterior diameter of the 
pharynx so that the soft palate touches the posterior pharyngeal wall to provide a good speech mechanism this is the picture pre op and the post op where you can see that there is a not only the lateral narrowing of the uh, nasopharynx also there is a lengthening of the soft palate which is helps in uh, a good speech so you can see that this is a pre op where there is a widen uh, nasopharynx and, and after the repair it lengthens very nicely uh, it is very important that these are the patients the post operatively should be kept in a lateral prone position these are uh, should avoid bleeding do a thorough good coagulation and uh, sometimes patient do develop a breakdown fistula formation and because of the scarring and the shortening you get develop a pelvic incompetence which can be treated later on if the patient goes for a speech therapy and if there is we find that the patient has got a speech deformity then we can do a nasal endoscopy uh, and see whether there is what can be done to the patient so we do a pharyngeal flap or we do a pharyngoplasty and this is a lateral palatogram which shows the distance between the two the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall is calculated and then accordingly we select the pharyngoplasty either a lateral wall pharyngoplasty or posterior pharyngeal augmentation or re repair of the palate or lengthening of the palate by using the buccal flaps so this is a re repair of palate by using a buccal flap and posterior pharyngeal wall augmentation using a med core or a costochondral graft so this is a picture showing the pre op and the post op a lateral view showing that a good uh, uh, push back of the soft palate and good closure of the velar pharynx to provide a good speech so this can be done uh, if the speech uh, evaluation is done and if they advise then we do this pharyngoplasty procedures this is the lateral wall pharyngoplasty then once the baby goes into the mixed dentition then uh, we send these patients for the orthodontic management so orthodontists realign the teeth nicely they expand the arch by using the arch expanders and then the baby you can see that uh, at the midline the x ray showing that the bony gap which bony back need uh, gap requires to be filled with the help of a cancellous bone graft and this operation is called as alveolar bone grafting this bone grafting uh, helps in bringing down the canine to its uh, cleft area and it also makes the entire arch into a one arch so that in near future if this patient requires orthognathic surgery then we can move the arch at the one piece so that is the advantage of this operation this is alveolar bone grafting operation which is done between the age of 9 to 12 years of age and you can see that this is a patient with a alveolar gap identified and we pack that alveolar gap with the help of a cancellous bone graft and you can see that the entire canine starts coming down that arch area is showing the bone graft and which is brought into center with the help of a orthodontic management then once that is over when the child goes into uh, a, a transition phase of uh, puberty to adulthood sometimes we combine the nose uh, repair along with the alveolar bone grafting because that is a time there is a good transition of uh, childhood to adulthood and in order to give good appearance to the child that we do uh, a minimum cleft nose rhinoplasty and a cleft has got a classic deformity where the there is not only antero posterior also the vertical uh, septum is deviated and even the alar cartilage is downward displaced which required to be uh, restored back so we can combine the alveolar bone grafting along with the uh, uh, nose rhinoplasty so we take out a strip of a cartilage we correct the nasal septum we correct the nasal septum we fill that gap with the help of a cancellous bone graft and then we do a open rhinoplasty approach where the alar cartilage is identified the alar cartilage is brought back to the normal position by doing a vy release uh, and bring it to the normal level and we also give a support in the midline of a harvested cartilage graft which not only provides a good support to the alar cartilage of the affected side it also gives good stability for mm -hmm. your uh, columella strut and it also gives support to the anterior caudal border which is kept in the midline so that the caudal border septum also stays in the midline 
and the deformity of the nasal cavity get corrected. So this is how you may, may keep the uh, midline cartilage in the uh, supports the ala cartilages, and then this ala cartilages are fixed and then redraped together, and we remove the excess amount of the skin from the ala rim used that uh, skin for the lining and you can achieve the symmetry on table where uh, both LR and arrow that LR borders are uh, aligned properly. You can see the pre-op and the post-op showing the good symmetrical alignment. Uh, these are some of the pre-op and the post-op results. A good arch alignment, good symmetry achieved, good LR are restored. The profile showing a good alignment of the uh, uh, LR cartilages. This is another patient where the lip is revised and the nose is revised. You can see the positioning of the LR cartilages, a good tip projection and the profile correction, the profile pre-op and the post-op. So doing a good, most of the patients, they require this touch-up when, in the, when they're going into the adulthood. And these are some of my results of the younger patient going in for the lip nose revision and barely see any deformity and correction. Some of the patients, they do require assessment with the help of a, in the form of a small osteotomy. So what we do, this particular patient had a pre-maxilla which has gone in. So my orthodontic colleague said that we require to be brought out. So what we do is we do an in-fracture, out-fracturing of the pre-maxilla, pack the bone graft behind, and we realign that uh, maxilla. My orthodontic colleague will place a bracket on it and bring that maxilla to its normal position. So at first stage we did that, and then at second stage we did a fork flap and a new rhinoplasty and bring that polymella up. And this is a pre-op after the first stage and after the second stage. So this is how we can correct the deformities: the polymella lengthening, the ala. Sometimes uh, the midline soft tissue is deficit and you can see the profile that the lower lip is bigger than the upper lip. So in that case, we use the tissue from the lower lip called as an abbey flap. So after good alignment, we do an abbey flap, a lower lip to upper lip to provide the polymella lengthening and provide a good lip projection. And you can see that you can give a good cosmetic unit into the midline from the lower lip. And the lower lip closure is done with the help of a very nice Z plasty there. So even the lower lip scar is barely visible. And you can see that a good profile is provided with the help of IAB flap. And another patient with IAB flap. Uh, lateral and another patient with IAB flap. Then most of the patients they do develop a uh, maxillofacial deformity. So you see the patient where the maxilla is gone in and the lower jaw is disproportionately uh, prognatic. So we do osteotomy of the maxilla after planning with the help of our orthodontic colleague. We make the occlusal wafer, we bring the maxilla forward. This is the occlusal wafer uh, for use of intraop uh, monitoring. In intraop, we do osteotomy, fix the uh, maxilla with the plates and the screws. And this is the profile we achieve. So this is uh, the pre-op and the post-op correction of the uh, jaw deformity. And this is pre-op and the post-op. You can see that the good pro profile is corrected. Another patient with the jaw deformity are realigned with the help of a maxillofacial surgery. Sometimes uh, we cannot operate on the upper jaw because of the lack of scarring. In that case, we do only the lower jaw and we do a cutting of the lower jaw, bring the jaw backward, or as a BSS so setback surgery. You can see that the profile gets corrected and the jaw deformity gets corrected. Some patients do require a genioplasty because of the chin retrusion, so we can do a chin osteotomy and bring the chin forward to give a good profile to the patient. This is a pre-op and a post-op, a sliding genoplasty. Some patients do have maxillary excess. Then we do osteotomy of the upper jaw, do the osteotomy, and do the lower jaw osteotomy, segmental osteotomy, and bring the jaw forward and realign this profile. 
So, in what is there in recent advances in managing the uh, jaw deformities? Some of the jaw deformities are so severe that only the jaw maxillofacial osteotomy or orthognathic procedures will not help. So, in that scenario, we do the distraction osteotomy. It is a at least our principle where we gradually bring the jaw forward after doing osteotomy. And then we put in a red device, which is the external device. After doing osteotomy, we bring the jaw forward slowly, steadily to achieve this maxillary advancement. And you can see that this is a patient. Another patient with the hemifacial uh, absence, so we do a unilateral distraction and correction of the midline. Same procedure we do it uh, sometimes untreated uh, pure or bin wear, pure, not managed by uh, conservative line of treatment and it, uh, tracheostomy dependent. So this particular patient, we uh, did a tongue to lip adhesion, but uh, he was not maintaining the saturation. So this is a tongue to lip adhesion, which is used to relieve the pressure, uh, nasopharyngeal obstruction. And then we suture the tongue to the lip and then this particular patient did require a tracheostomy. And then we trained the patients relative for the tracheostomy treatment. And then we did a, a repair of the cleft palate. And then despite of repeated tea cannulating procedure, he was desaturating. So what we have decided to do a uh, osteotomy and bring the jaw forward. So this is the internal device of the osteotomy. So we do the osteotomy and place a distractor and start distracting and bring the jaw forward. And you can see that as soon as we start distracting forward, <laughs> this is the distraction <laughs> procedure where we can see <laughs> that the airway gets increased nicely. <laughs> and then because of that, the airway is increased. We were in position to remove the tracheostomy. So this particular patient of a PR of being got benefited with this procedure of the distraction osteogenesis. So these are the patients uh, do they are need to be planned properly and need to be selected properly. So uh, this particular patient did benefit with the uh, distraction procedure and at the time of removal, you can see a good amount of bone is formed and we have removed the distractor. And at the same time, we disconnected the tongue to lip adhesion. So this is a patient and this is the long-term results for years follow-up showing a good jaw development and he's following with me for another years. Sometimes uh, the requirement is much more in the case of a PR organ then we put in an external device. Uh, these are all the difficult integration patients. So we did a tracheostomy. We did a distraction by using the external device. We did the external device and osteotomy. And you can see that there is a good distraction and new bone formation. But these are the patients need to be watched. Some of these patients, they do relapse. They need to be watched and overcorrect over and maintain. So in our protocol of the managing the cleft lip, uh, in uh, managing the PR obing, uh, we try to manage it conservatively, bilateral bone position and nasopharyngeal airway and other methods. With those patients, we do, do not reply, re, respond. We do a tongue to lip adhesion. And at the age of eight, nine months, when we do a cleft palate, at that time, we disconnect the tongue to lip adhesion. And very severe form where these are the, these are the patients who don't reply, uh, don't respond to the uh, tongue to lip adhesion or who are tracheostomy dependent, they require a distraction of the mandible. So this is a patient which we distracted uh, for so in cleft lip and palate management, our protocol is uh, a lip with anterior palate anytime after four months, three to four months, a cleft palate repair anytime after eight to 12 months, speech assessment and related speech problems, pharyngoplasty, we can do anytime after five years, alveolar bone grafting and septorhinoplasty anytime after nine years to 12 years. Uh, uh, after uh, assessing with the help of an uh, uh, orthodontist. Uh, distraction osteogenesis for correction of the severe secondary deformities and orthognathic jaw surgeries after 18 to 19 years and uh, lip nose and other soft tissue surgeries after that. I have been associated with Smile Train for last 22 years doing a free charitable services at 
Shishusha Hospital and SSC Children's Hospital. This is my number. Uh, any poor patients are welcome for the free services. Thank you very much. And this is a team effort of plastic surgeons, orthodontists, and speech therapists and pediatricians. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, thank you very much for. Are there any questions you can? Yes, Irene. Hello. Yeah, uh, sir, am I audible or not? Yes, yes. Now you are audible. Now I'm audible. Yeah. So uh, uh, the doctors will be interested in the uh, program you are having at SRCC. Now, can you just tell us about those things? Hello. Yes, here. What is the question? Hello. Ah, the Smile Train project is the NGO uh, who runs uh, 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 who are partner hospitals. We are all the partner hospitals at SRCC. So they provide us uh, the funds to treat the patients for uh, four surgeries. The cleft lip repair, the cleft palate repair. If there is a palatal breakdown or fistula, then fistula closure. Then uh, a repair of the alveolar bone grafting and a lip nose revision. So for five surgeries, they provide us the funds. Patient don't have to pay a single penny. Patient don't have to pay a money, uh, money for the investigations. So all these patients are treated free of cost. Only thing that they have to be under privilege and that uh, our medical social worker first screens the patient and then they decide about uh, whether this patient is eligible for the smile train or not. I have been associated with smile train from the smile uh, train. Any, any more questions from the delegates? Yeah, so uh, if there are no more questions, and we are ready uh, for the next one topics, I would just like to narrate you the next thing in the mid of the uh, July. And the topics are, we have got Dr. Parish Desai, who is our senior pediatrician. He'll be speaking on the management of the fever in children. Then, who is our senior pediatric surgeon. She will speak on uh, management of the antenatal and uh, our last session will be uh, done by our one of the moderator, Dr. Sruti Bansal, who is consultant. And she will be uh, uh, taking one of the topics from the ENT area. 
uh, did yet. So uh, thanks, thank you once one more time for attending today's lecture. And next time, yeah, thank you.